Hey, welcome, folks. We're going to go ahead and uh, get this started. Uh, my name is Tim Harden um, for Elijah Audubon. Um, I'm going to introduce our speaker uh, for tonight's um, Audubon Evening Program, which is Monitoring Turns in Maine. Um, and Brian uh, Camarano will be uh, uh, talking to us today. Uh, first, um, just want to talk uh, about a few uh, upcoming events for Elijah Audubon. Um, Wednesdays, we have our Wednesday wetland walks um, at Sweetwater Wetlands Park. Um, so you can show up there on Wednesdays at 8.30 and uh, there'll be guided walks uh, throughout the year, um, aside from the summer months. So come on out. We'll be uh, doing uh, we'll be doing that tomorrow at 8.30, actually. Um, I'll be out there. Um, and other upcoming events for this weekend, uh, Sunday the 16th, we have a Audubon field trip. Uh, to um, Bulware Springs, um, led by um, Dr. Andy Cratter, the um, Ornithological Collections Manager at the UF Museum of Natural History. So that'll be great. Um, check out our events uh, on our uh, webpage at lachawadabon.org. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Brian. Um, Brian is an avid birder. Um, uh, an avian conservationist and uh, a graduate uh, of University of Central Florida with a degree in ecology, evolutionary, and conservation biology. Um, so Brian's uh, been working a lot of seasonal seasonal jobs to experience firsthand what it takes to be a field biologist. Um, so uh, you know he's uh, been involved with lots of avian conservation efforts like songbird banding in Key Biscayne uh, for the Cape Florida Banding Station. Uh, grassland songbird uh, nest searching in eastern Michigan, uh, black rail detection surveying in Big Cypress, and uh, monitoring uh, beach nesting birds in southwest Florida. So I'll go ahead and hand it off to uh, Brian, and uh, you know you can mention it, uh, a few of those uh, you know project puffin um, uh, experiences and things like that. But without further ado, thank you so much, Brian, for speaking with us tonight um, for the uh, this evening program. Thank you. Just need you to unmute there, Brian. Uh, Brian, do you want to go ahead and kick it off? Let's see it. There we go. It was saying host uh, wasn't oh, allowed. I'm oh, sorry about that. No, you're good. All right, got it fixed now. And then am I, and can you make me host in order for me to? Yes. Yeah, thank you. There we go. All right. All right, thanks, Tim. And thank you, Alatra Audubon, for letting me do this presentation. We'll go ahead and get started. One second. All right, can you all see my screen? Tim, you can see it? One second. I need to share my screen. Okay. Good now? All right. Perfect. So let me just get this going here. All right. So this is my presentation on, let me shrink this too. So this is my presentation on working and living in a seabird colony um, on Stratton Island, Maine. Uh, one second. So this past summer, I had the opportunity to uh, research and monitor a turn colony on Stratton Island, Maine. And I will talk about my experiences. So, what is Project Puffin? So Project Puffin, they hired me as a research assistant to uh, monitor these turns. 
So a little background on the project and how it started. Uh, it started in 1973 by the National Audubon Society as an effort to restore puffins to their historical nesting sites in the Gulf of Maine. Um, so the story behind this is uh, puffins used to, puffins and other seabirds used to uh, use the, the coast of Maine to nest and um, during the breeding season. And during the colonial days, uh, a lot of the islands were uh, hunted, the, the birds were hunted on the islands uh, for their meat, their feathers, and during the breeding seasons for their, for their eggs. Uh, so 300 years later, um, there's just way too detrimental to the colonies and um, it was heavily exploited. And so now we're looking at the 1970s when Dr. Stephen Kress had an idea to uh, try to restore these islands back to their, their natural way of having puffins and other seabirds nesting on them. And so what happened was he had the idea to partner with National Audubon Society and um, get puffin chicks from Newfoundland and transport them over to Eastern Egg Rock, which is one of the islands off the coast of Maine that historically had uh, puffins on it. Um, the Newfoundland um, colony was very healthy. And so there, there wasn't much impact on importing those um, or transporting those uh, puffins. Um, through strong efforts of you know, setting up decoys and hand rearing these, these puffins and these artificial burrows that he created on, on Eastern Egg Rock, uh, he, he was very successful. Um, it took a lot of effort, but after about a decade, he had returning puffins and um, due to puffins having very high nest fidelity, so wherever they were kind of raised and fledged, they're likely to return to that spot um, to, to breed. And they're, they're, they breed in low uh, numbers, as in they, only produce, they typically only produce one egg and try to uh, rear that chick. And they're only um, uh, sexually mature after five years. So you can see how the, during the colonial days when they were being exploited, how that impact they weren't able to re recover after that. But through all these efforts, um, they're able to restore them along with the seabirds with them. So including terns and other alcids like guillemots and murres. And so people, you know, internationally and globally heard about all the, these efforts that they put into the, the Gulf of Maine. And now Audubon has a program called the Audubon Seabird Restoration Program, and they actively work to benefit uh, rare and endangered seabirds worldwide, providing restoration methods and promoting seabird conservation appreciation. So all the methods and techniques we used um, in the Project Puffin project, uh, we shared those methods and techniques with other um, organizations. Um, you know, we have in the Galapagos, they're, they're helping to restore storm petrels in Japan, um, albatrosses, and then um, a very successful um, endeavor was the Chinese crested terns in China. So it's, it's an international scale now. Okay, so homing in on actually Project Puffin and what they do. Um, we have the seven islands. We have Seal Island, Matinicus, and Eastern Egg Rock, those northern islands. Those are the islands that have puffins and terns. Um, and then we have the southern islands, Jenny, Pond, Outer Green, and Stratton. Those four are strictly turn islands. So we don't, we don't have the, the puffins there. It's too far south for the breeding range. And I worked on Stratton Island, which was the turn island and the southernmost island. So what's cool about Stratton Island, it's the northernmost range for a few species that breed there. And then it's the southernmost breeding range for a few other species. And I'll get, get into that later. And now homing in on Stratton Island, uh, it is the centerpiece of the Phineas W. Sprague Memorial Sanctuary. So right there on the right, you can see that it has a total uh, area of 21 acres. Um, it's a large island, uh, just a few miles off the coast of Southern Maine. And you can see how we have a wide variety of habitat there. So the island offers a 
a variety of nesting habitat for breeding birds, including interior deciduous forests. So that forest is in that yellow area. We have songbirds and swallows nesting there. Um, then we have a large pond right in the middle. Uh, a lot of waterfowl nests there. And uh, a mature apple orchard. So that'll be the, the green section, zone one, two, and three. Um, so this island used to be a cattle and um, apple orchard farm. And so after that was abandoned and it became a sanctuary, uh, that, that uh, apple orchard became a, a wading bird rookery. So now we have wading birds nesting there. And then of course, most importantly, the long southern strip of beach is for the turn. So that on the south there, we have a section labeled one through 11. Um, all that is kind of has this nice low vegetation, um, sandy and rocky shores that the turns really like nesting on. So we'll get into the breeding birds now. Uh, we'll start off with wading birds. Uh, this year in particular was a good year uh, for me to be a research assistant because I had the opportunity to um, conduct or help conduct the wading bird census. It's done every other year. And what that means is we go into the rookery and we try to count and, uh, count and identify as many uh, wading bird nests as we can in the allotted time. We don't, we don't want to spend too much time in there. Uh, and cause disturbance because the, the birds do flush and that uh, leaves the nests exposed to, you know, the elements. And so um, we have uh, mostly glossy ibis nesting on the island. Uh, then we have snowy egrets and greedy, great egrets and only a handful of little blue herons and um, as well as only a handful of, of black crown night herons. Uh, on the left left hand side, you can see a photo of us using like a mirror pole, and it's just out of reach to be able to peek in there. So we use these mirror poles to really stretch our view, and you can see that we can see three uh, great egret eggs in there. So great egrets like utilize like a large platform nest. It's a large bird, so it needs to come down and land appropriately. So they the way we identify those nests are through the, the large platforms. Um, the middle top photo is a glossy ibis nest. So there you can see a lot of reeds, dried up reeds in the nest and uh, very deep blue eggs. Those are um, characteristics of a glossy ibis nest. And that bottom middle photo, you can see those pale powdery blue eggs with very fine sticks for their nest. That's a snowy egret nest. Um, little blue herons are very similar to the snowy egrets, but we only had a handful of pairs there, so um, we weren't able to confirm little blue heron through the wading bird census, but we did see uh, young popping up throughout the season. And then another photo of a glossy ibis nest is there on the right hand side, that deep blue again, and then this one even used some dried up leaves to line its nest. Uh, the black crown night herons, they, we only had a handful of those, and they like to utilize like kind of the, the nooks and crannies and forks of uh, trees and make a, a bit of a deeper nest. Um, so we found a few of those. Uh, next, next breeding birds are the shorebirds and the waterfowl. Uh, we only have two species of shorebirds nesting on the island, spotted sandpipers um, kind of sprinkled around the island. They just kind of need a, a clump of uh, vegetation where they can make a small little cup nest and have their little eggs. What's cool about them is they have these this uh, method of laying their eggs in a kind of like the point of the eggs all point towards the center. And on the bottom right there, you can see a spotted sandpiper chick with that black eyeline going through its eye. Um, and then we have American oyster catchers as the other shorebird. Uh, that, that's one of the species that I mentioned is their northernmost range. So they nest all along the Atlantic coast. Um, and so, this is their northernmost range. They really just need um, light gravel, rocky shores, and you can see how well their eggs camouflage. And then we have the waterfowl. Uh, we have in that uh, middle lake, we've had Canada geese, mallard, gadwall, blue winged teal, green winged teal, northern shoveler, all nesting on that middle uh, lake or pond. And then um, the common eiders actually, they're sea ducks, so they, they actually utilize a lot of the island. Just They kind of just need a 
hidden vegetation with with some tangles and an easy escape route and they'll um they'll nest on the island in huge numbers so right there in the top left you can see a, a common eider chick that one went kind of lost its way and i helped it back to to the coast and uh so this this year was actually another one of those census years where um, we do a common eider census. They're done every four years. So what that entails is since they kind of utilize anything and any everywhere on the island, we try to cover the entire island. So we're you know crawling around trying to catch um, common eider hens on their nest. Uh, they they really like to incubate for extended periods of time. So um, you are going to flush a handful of them, but uh, you're able to usually see the hen on nest and you just mark down hen on nest. We don't, we don't really like to disturb them unless um, they're pretty camouflaged and sometimes you just spook them because you didn't notice them. And we totaled in over around 500 uh, common eider nests. Um, all the other waterfowl are, are in very low numbers, um, Canada geese being the most. Um, handful of mallards and very few of everything else. Okay, and now looking at the seabirds. So the main um, birds we're researching and monitoring on the island. Uh, we'll start out with the most abundant uh, breeder, the common tern. So this is an adult in breeding plumage. Um, the best way to identify these are looking at its bill. You have that very orange bill with the black tip, and then you have the dark primaries you can see that dark the dark on the, the on the primaries there and um, their tail doesn't really extend past their their wings so they have these tail streamers these sternoterns have these tail streamers um common terns don't really have that long of tail streamers uh, then we have the roseate tern so they're federally listed so we very closely monitor to these guys uh, in breeding plumage you have this very dark cap and very dark long pointed bill um, with those tail streamers extending well past the, the wings. You can see there in the photo, the tail streamers just way out there. Um, and they have the kind of like these very orangey reddish legs and not so much uh, dark on the primaries. And then we have Arctic terns, um, only a handful of Arctic terns on the island. It's one of those species it's on their southernmost range so th there's a huge colony on a few of the other islands that project push been puffing overseas but on ours we we only had i think up to eight eight or eight to ten um arctic tern nests um oh and briefly i'll go back common terns we had around 1300 nests on our island on that small strip of beach roseate terns up to 110 pairs and Arctic tern, like I said, eight to 10. Um, they're, they're a lot easier to, to identify when you notice their real deep ruby red bills and their very short stubby legs, um, also ruby red. Um, and their, their tail streamers extend a, a bit past their tail or a, a bit past their wings. So that's a, another way to notice them among the crowd of, of common terns. And then on our sandy shore, we have a small colony of least terns. Um, this is the only island out of the seven islands that Pro Project Puffin manages that has least terns. So that's another special thing about our island. Uh, these are small little terns that, uh, that they're, they have this white forehead patch, the yellow bill and the small yellow legs. We had about uh, 70 nesting pairs of, of least turn. And now we'll look at the seabird chicks. So now you saw the breeding adults and now we'll look at what the chicks and the eggs look like. So Arctic terns, they usually have this uh, more bluish tint to the eggs, um, but it's very variable. So the best way to mm, confirm Arctic tern nests is to just, if you kind of think you have an Arctic tern nest, stake it out um, and see if the adults return and try to identify the adult. Uh, but the chicks, they look like um, they have a very dark face to them. So it's almost like they have a beard and on their face, they, it's some darkness to it. 
Um, then we have the common turn, that bottom left photo. Uh, this is a cool mm -hmm. photo because you can see a day old chick is that top one that it doesn't really look wet at all. Um, then you have just a few hours old chick, very wet, and you can even see remnants of the of the eggshell there on the bottom right. And then um, and then an egg, and and that egg, uh, if if it was enlarged, if the image was enlarged, you can kind of see it starring. So it's starring mean is is uh, the the chick is just about to hatch, and it's using its egg tooth to to crack the shell and, and emerge. So that egg tooth is you can see it on all these uh, chicks here. It's that white tip on the on the bill and it's uh it's kind of like a calcium a hardened calcium tip that eventually falls off the the bill but they use it uh to emerge out of their egg and then you have the least turn chicks very easy to recognize They're just a very tiny chick with powdery sandy yellow and then we have the roseate turn chicks so those almost look like hedgehoggy they have very spiky feathers gives them like a hedgehog appearance and then we don't have puffins on the island, but we do have another alcid in the, another alcid and within the alcid family being the, the black guillemot. So we don't really do much um, monitoring on them due to the low numbers of them, but we try to just identify it uh, and confirm any nests that we come across. They use these very um, deep kind of rocky caverns to, to nest in, so it takes, takes some some curiosity and some attention to detail on when the black guillemots are coming in to feed their young or incubate. All right, now we'll talk about uh, the predators that um, we come across on the island. Um, any type of goal uh, is going to be an opportunistic predator to the colony. Um, on a close by island, we have great black back goals and herring goals nesting on them. So let's say a peregrine falcon comes by and, and creates a, you know, chaos and the turns like to mob uh, whatever predator is, is, is harassing the colony. And so as the peregrine's flying off, the whole, col the whole colony usually tries to mob the peregrine. And that's when the goals will come in and um, opportunistically try to predate on you know, the eggs or maybe some young chicks. Um, the peregrine uh, is a supplemental hunter. So what that means is it takes what it needs and then it's gone, which is ideal for the colony. Um, it usually made its rounds early in the morning. It would take maybe an adult or a chick, whatever it needed to um, be full for the day and then maybe come back at, at sunset. Um, that it's not much um, you know, pressure on the colony to have a peregrine um, doing this. Um, it does cause you know, opportunities for the goals to come in, but um, it's peregrines just doing what it does. And um, another, a quote from Dr. Stephen Kress is, um, we're trying to restore these birds back into the ecosystem. So these birds are not at the top of the food chain. So in order to um, restore this, uh, we need to accept that there will, there will be predation, there'll be natural predation, such as the peregrine falcons coming by. It's a food source for them, and as well as the goals. Um, our nocturnal hunter is the black crowned night heron. Um, we only had a handful of those, but they did do some damage to the least turn colony and um, the edges of, of the main colony. Um, they go out at night and kind of just sneak their way into getting a meal. And uh, they can really cause some damage because they'll just eat until they're full and then keep eating. So it's really, um, it's really uh, ideal to catch it early and then make the right decision on how to deter these, this, uh, these pest uh, black crown night herons. And now we'll move on to the actual research and the monitoring that we did. Um, so we, the main goal of, of the research and monitoring is to assess breeding productivity through chick, chick growth and survival. So the way that we monitor growth and survival is we have these plot points or these plot areas where we fence off very low, a very low fence, just kind of to mark, to, 
to be able for us to recognize what the plot looks like. Um, we fence off a, an area uh, up to six on the on the in the within the colony, kind of randomly first around the colony, where whatever's inside that uh, area is what we're going going to closely closely monitor, so that we have an idea of the overall health of the colony. So we're not going to monitor every single chick, and we're not going to ban any and take all these data take all this data from each chick. We're just going to home in on certain sections of it and then make an assumption of the health of the colony through that. Um, so what that meant is um, as the chicks are hatching, um, it just needs to be, you know, a handful of hours before they can be handled and um, be banded. So we go into the colony, um, we try to limit our time there just due to the birds, you know, um, being harassed and uh, causing disturbance, we want to limit that. So we measure the wing cord of the of the chick, and we measure their weight. And those two factors give us an idea of how healthy a chick is. Um, and we monitor these chicks until um, until fledged, or if they die, we we note that that they are missing or they're dead. We do this every other day. Um, so we have six plots. We had six plots on, on my island. Um, we did three plots one day, the next three plots the next. And once they were old enough to kind of run around and we weren't sure where, where they came from, we, we throw them into a banana box. We walk down to the shore of the colony where there's not as many nests and there's minimal disturbance. And we um, measured and assessed all the chicks there. And then we knew which nest they belonged to due to their, their band number, and we were able to return them to their nest after that. Oh, and I wanted to mention, so you can see the, those adults there on my shoulder. Um, those, they get pretty uh, comfortable with you being around. Eventually, they'll land on you and kind of just, they'll be curious and they'll be kind of yelling in your ear. Um, and you can see their techniques and methods of um, deterring you is they poop all over you and they come down and peck at you. So you can see my shirt is just full of, of bird poop and um, my hat even has, you know, some damage up the, at the crown where they, they just come down and, and peck you as hard as they can They come dive bombing you. All right, and now we're moving on to the roseate research. Um, so since they're federally listed, uh, we very closely monitor them and we want to um, you know, get as much data off of them in order to understand them better. Uh, we try to mark off every confirmed roseate turn nest. Um, we mark them off with these pink flags. Uh, they prefer these, these caverns. Um, we uh, pre-season, we set up the whole uh, rosy area. They're, they have this like, designated preferred area where we set up all these rock structures that look like caverns. They like to kind of nest in these little caves. Um, the commons, they'll just nest anywhere, any open area, they'll make a scrape, but the rosies really prefer these, these caverns and caves. So we'll try to confirm as many as those as we can. Um, and then as the chicks are hatching, we'll band and uh, put federal or put plastic field readables on their left leg. So what this does is it, it makes it easier to recite these, these birds when, um, whenever they fledge and um, they're seen by you know, citizen scientists or other biologists along their migration path. So that can help um, gather a lot of data rather than have the bird in hand or, or get close enough to get its metal um, number. You can scope, you know, tons of, of roseates as they're migrating through. Um, so this one, easy, it's a yellow band and it's, it looks like it's HT2. And then here we have my office for most of the day. It was a bird blind. We set these up uh, pre-season in designated areas where um, there's high activity of nesting turns. 
Um, most of the time we're spending about three hours at a time in a blind stint. And these bird blinds, they provide um, us to very closely monitor them. Um, and we're, we're collecting passive and observable data while we're in there. Um, we're causing minimal disturbance as well, because once you step into that blind and put up a few curtains, they, they really um, don't even recognize you that you're in there. You kind of disappear to them. So out of sight, out of mind kind of situation. And like I said, it allows us to closely monitor the colony and collect data with minimal disturbance. There you can see um, us uh, collecting a few chicks. And if you look a little closer, you can see that little fenced off area. So that's one of our productivity plots. And then while we're in those blind stints, um, what we are uh, mostly doing are feeding studies. So once the chicks have hatched, we really wanna know what these adults are coming in to feed them and how often they are coming in to feed them. So we, we are assessing diet and feeding rate. So the way we do that is um, in our three hours blind since we have a few marked off nests that are very visible and don't have many obstructions away so that we can really see what's coming in and what's being fed to the chicks. So after we have our designated nests, you know, maybe five or six nests that you are looking at for those three hours, um, where there's data to be collected on, on what is being brought in. So in order of importance, we'll start out with prey species and size. So let's say, for example, a uh, roseate tern is coming in and it looks like it's about to land at nest five. We'll try to see what it's bringing in. Um, you know, there's, there's a handful of, of prey species or more than a handful. There's many prey species that they can bring in, uh, but only a handful of very common stuff. So you get the hang of it when it's mostly common stuff like sand lands, herring, butterfish. Um, so there's definitely some um, training involved before you step into a blind and really try to uh, identify these prey species because it's just small foraging fish. But once you get it down, um, it's, it becomes more routine. So you try to identify that prey species and like, for example, that right, right hand picture is a roseate tern coming in with a sand lance. And then you want to look at the size. So the size would be a Coleman length. We, we measure them through Coleman lengths. That left hand picture or photo, you see a common tern with um, its Coleman length is the base of the bill to the tip of the bill. So um, we look at that rosy and we say, you know, it's perpendicular. So we use our best judgment and we'll say maybe a 1.5, 1.75 Coleman length. Uh, sand lands 1.5, 1.7 Coleman length. So that's, you know, the most important thing to get is that. Then you look at which chick was fed. So the bird landed. Um, the way we mark our chicks is beforehand, we'll go, we have a, a marker, designated markers for each nest. Um, the A chick, meaning the chick that hatched first, is going to get, um, you know, marker on its crown, a bit, just a mark, like a I mean, a red marker, a blue marker. Um, and then the bee chick, if there is a bee chick, it'll be marked with um, on its back with the same color marker for that nest. And if there is a sea chick, very, very rarely um, is there a sea chick that, you know, survives too long. But when there is, we, we mark it appropriately. They get their marking on their belly. So let's say this nest that we're, we're um, doing the feeding study on, has an A and a B chick and Rosie turn comes in and feeds the, the, or the A chick, you know, since it's a bit stronger and it was born earlier, um, it gets, it gets the fish, gets it all the way down. So we mark, okay, A chick was fed. And then that's the most important data. Um, then you keep going down um, time of arrival, you know, quick look at your watch, departure, departure can be variable. Most of the time, the adult will land, check out what's going on, check up on its chicks, see if any anything new happened or what's going on. After that, it'll fly off and go um, uh, forage again. So usually, that's you know between a one to five minute uh, window. And then, um, if you have the chance, um, we try to identify which adult. Uh, they're not sexually sexually dimorphic. So the best we can do is try to pick nests that have a banded adult and an unbanded adult. 
that you can quickly see like, oh, that was the banded adult that came in and fed the chick. Uh, if not, then we just put unidentified adult and that's fine. That's not the primary um, objective there. So that's just one feeding study that we just did. And that can happen you know, in a fraction of a second or maybe a few seconds. You gotta collect all that data. We do our best. Um, it's observable data. So all we can do is our best. Um, during peak season, there can be, you know, three feeds going in at the same time. What's most important is, let's say you weren't able to collect any data. The most important is that you saw maybe an adult go to nest two while you were doing nest five. Um, you saw an adult go to nest two and feed a chick. You don't know, you don't even know if it was an A or B chick. So you just mark down that, okay, nest two, someone was fed. Um, so just any information that you can get, try to record. Okay, now we'll move on to um, another passive and observable um, uh, research that we do is resetting the banded breeding adults. So most of this is done um, pre-season or I guess pre-nesting is when a lot of the roseates, and we focus primarily on the roseates due to them having the, those plastic field readables um, and just being able to collect as much data as we can. Opportunistically, we'll try to get um, BBL bands of the Arctic and common terns, but that can be a bit difficult. Uh, so pre-nesting, you know, you'll have the, the adult rosies paired up and looking at potential nest sites and they'll be on the ground for an extended periods of times, so, you know, checking out the nest and giving you looks, great looks at their legs. So that's the best opportunity to get um, recite data of who's returning to breed. And then post-season, um, it's a good opportunity to get the fledglings that we banded um, during season, the ones that have fledged and are you know, getting ready to migrate with their parents. Um, you'll catch them on the shore, um, you know, maybe flying not too far in distance, but they'll be begging most likely on a rock, begging for their parents to come in and, and feed them. Um, and so that's great data is to know who successfully fledged. Um, and so we can do that through a bird blind, like I said before, we, those blinds we set up, we'll, we'll use a scope and, and, and uh, try to recite from there. Or if you, you notice an area that you can't really see with your scope through the bird blind, you set up a portable blind there. You can see on the left-hand side, um, you set up a portable blind and it's like you're not even there. And you'll have a scope and you'll just try to recite um, as many birds as you can. So that's all the research and monitoring we, we, we do. Now I'll talk briefly about um, island life. So, um, I do spend the entirety of the season on the island. So this is um, remote camping. Um, we tent camp for the duration of the season from you know, early May to early August. Um, and on that right hand photo, you can see it's, you know, there's some privacy there. You have a platform and your own tent. And then, you know, however far down the forest, you have another tent. Um, this is an island that has a bit more privacy than others. Um, other islands, there isn't much room to um, set up all these platforms, so they're a bit more in close proximity. Um, and so this island we have, or most of the islands, they have this permanent um, three-sided kitchen shelter. You can see that on the left-hand picture on the right side, um, that uh, wooden structure there. Um, that's where we set up our solar panels and we cook and we set up our little table and it's kind of like a communal area and then that white canvas tent is our research tent that's where we keep all our valuables and you know, all the paperwork and data sheets and anything that really can't afford to get wet or damaged we keep in that tent and so that photo shows everything that was brought out the first day of the season. So you can see that it was a huge haul of, of resources. Um, we get resupplied on, on food and water every three to four weeks. So we try to have wa uh, food and water for, you know, extended period of times of four to five weeks before, in case there was an emergency and we couldn't get um, resupplied in three or four weeks. Uh, so our, our island actually has a boat. So we're, it was a bit more um, 
you know, there wasn't that much risk because um, we had a, a boat anchored off off the off the island that we can uh, go to and, and in case of any emergency. Other islands um a bit more remote and they don't have their own boat and and so they they really need to uh, uh, be prepared for any kind of um you know logistical nightmares that that might happen. Um, but I mean we had our own logistical nightmares. All this stuff had to get brought onto the island. So that means, you know, at the docks, food gets brought to the docks, then supplies gets put onto the boat. Then the boat goes over to the island. Uh, you get the supplies onto a um, Avon, kind of inflatable rowboat. And then you row the Avon all the way to shore. You get all, all the supplies off onto shore. And then you haul all the supplies um, from shore to the, the research area or the, re or the camp area. So you can see how just logistically, it's a lot of steps to get um, everything from point A to B. And uh, unfortunately there was, a, there was no running water. So no showers, um, I guess no traditional showers. Uh, I took a few dips in the, in the ocean and kind of cleaned up whenever I could, um, but it's very primitive. Um, you gotta be willing to, you know, not feel comfortable most of the time, but you get used to it. And, uh, we had an outhouse that, um, we used a peat moss to, um, it was like a compost peat moss, uh, situation for the outhouse. All right. And now we covered research and monitoring and, you know, me living on the island, now we'll really talk about um, why we're doing this research and why we're monitoring these turns. Um, it's really to, you know, get a good idea of what the status is of these seabirds on the Gulf of Maine. Um, so what, after all these years of doing this research collectively, we're seeing a shift of mostly good years. So a bunch of good years with a few bad years. So that's, that's the ideal situation. It's shifting from that to mostly bad years with just a few good years in between. So, so why is that? Um, the main thing being, of course, climate change. So, um, you know, the temperatures are rising in the Gulf of Maine pretty exponentially, and that's causing a lot of factors to um, affect uh, these nesting birds. So the two big ones are foraging fish are moving farther out into cooler waters. So um, these foraging fish that usually would spend their, their summer months, um, you know, close proximity to these ne um, nesting, these seabird nesting islands, they're moving farther out into the cooler waters. So now they're out of, almost out of range for the terns to forage in and feed their chicks. So, um, during the breeding season, all these birds are restricted to, you know, just a, maybe a few kilometers um, from their island in order to bring back uh, prey items for their chicks. So the, the terns, you know, they, they're resorting to less desirable prey items and feeding less frequently. So the less desirable prey items include uh, this species called butterfish. On the right hand photo, you can see it's this very wide fish that uh, when fed to a chick, the chick most likely will not be able to ingest it, get it all the way down because it's just too wide. And so a lot of energy is put into getting this prey item to the chick and it never pays off because the chick just can't um, swallow it. So energy is put into you know the turn, the adult parent turn going out to sea um, hunting for this fish, coming back to the island, offering it to the chick, the chick spending an incredible amount of energy into trying to swallow this, this uh, fish and ultimately giving up on the fish. And now um, the chick hasn't eaten anything and the adult has to go and find um, you know, a different, different prey item. And sometimes they even return with another butterfish. So it's just a horrible cycle that continues throughout the season. And most likely those chicks just won't make it um, 
still suffer starvation. Um, and then feeding less frequently, of course, because if they do manage to find um, these desirable foraging fish out at sea, um, like I said, they're moving farther out into cooler water, so they'll be much farther away. And typically, if you know a chick was being fed you know, five to six times in an hour, now it's only being fed one to two. Um, so feeding is a lot less frequent. Um, so that you know development of the chick is going to slow down. Just nothing good can come from that. Um, and then we have the, another factor, of course, is the storms. So the storms are becoming more frequent and more intense. So due to climate change, we're having you know, these big storms move through during the breeding season and kind of just decimate the, the, the whole colony um, and cause a lot of um, chicks to succumb to exposure. So um, what really sucked this season was we had a big storm come through um, at probably the worst time. It was the time where most of the chicks were too big to fit under their parents to, to be incubated while, while the storms moved through and kind of hold out the storm. And, and um, too small, or sorry, they were, yeah, they were too big to fit under the parent and they were too small to be able to withstand the, the storm um, on their own without being incubated or, or warmth from their parent. So it was that in-between um, uh, stage that uh, caused their demise. Um, you know, the, the later, um, later hatching chicks did a bit better because they were able to um, withstand the storm under their parents. And then the older chicks, the real early hatchers um, were able to um, pull through. And here on the left hand side, you can see the rain gauge. Uh, this was um, a day where we had a big storm roll through and it was about, you know, over three inches of rain in a very short amount of time. So um, obviously the, the birds were heavily affected by this um, and also the crew. Um, it was a very wet season. So that brought a lot of mildew and um, just uh, we we do not work in the rain, so some some days we we weren't able to you know collect data be, due to um, the storms moving through. So with all that said, um, let's think about what we can do. So um, we're the the Project Puffin is going to continue doing what they do. Um, there's a bunch of organizations working out of the Gulf of Maine um, that are helping um, to really find out. What we what we can do to you know promote stronger regulation of the management, stronger reg regulation and management of the herring fisheries, um, you know starts from the bottom. If we really try to focus on the herring fisheries, then everyone will benefit above that. Um, so we'll keep doing what we do, um, gathering evidence and gathering data to to really promote um, stronger regulation, um, and then. Of course, we, you can support seaweed conservation and help raise awareness. Um, just like I'm doing now, I'm speaking to you all about uh, seaweed conservation and my experience here on the island. Um, it'd be great if you can spread the word, let people know about what's going on up in the Gulf of Maine. There's you know, a million problems in the world, but the only thing you can protect is things you know about and care about. So it's always great to uh, raise awareness about any of those things. And, um, if you really want to get involved, um, you can visit uh, projectpuffin.audubon.org, uh, where they have um, a few links to, you know, they have an adopt a puffin where you symbolically adopt a puffin. Um, you're providing money to the project and funding the project, which is great. And there's a few benefits. Um, you get a little certificate and a biography of your puffin, and uh, and the book about um, how Stephen Crest brought the puffins back to the island. Uh, you can always just straight up donate um, to the project. And um, there's also uh, volunteer opportunities where uh, Hog Island does tons of um, volunteer work, um, adults, um, and teenagers, kids. Uh, there's plenty of opportunities if you look into that. Um, there's, there's teams that go out to the islands during the off season and they, you know, they help with marine debris and they create um, just a bunch of small projects during the off season that, that really benefits them. 
the crew and the birds during the, the breeding season. And then um, as we meant, as we talked about climate change, we can always on an individual level, we can work on reducing our carbon footprint. So we can always just think more green and um, just try to utilize our resources you know, on a uh, necessity basis rather than wanting. So just use what you need and always uh, think green. All right, so thank you for listening to my presentation. Um, I guess I'll open the floor now to, um, to anyone that has any questions. Uh, maybe Tim can step in now and monitor that. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for listening. Do I just pass the host to you? Uh, I actually, I think I was able to reclaim it. Okay, perfect. There we go. Sweet. All right, anyone have any questions? Thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, you're welcome. Was... Hope everyone learned a few things and have a few takeaways. Is there any in the chat or any of that? Yeah, Chloe has a question. Okay. Chloe says, how do you get involved in an opportunity like this? Um, so as a research assistant, um, that's, it's just, um, it's seasonal work. So uh, you have to have an open summer and um, willingness to, to, you know, learn all these new skills. Uh, if you're, you know, a college student, um, it's always great to get involved locally first. So try to volunteer on any kind of bird work and your local um, area. And then, you know, during the summer, if you have a summer off, then go ahead and, you know, apply to these jobs. You don't need too much experience. Um, there's, it's a lot of uh, pre-training before you get there. And, and, and once you're there, a lot of training, just, yeah, just apply, try to network within the community. It's not too big of a community. So networking usually is pretty easy. Uh, and yeah, just go from there. Sweet. Um, Emily asks, uh, do you have any plans to work there again? So next summer, I actually won't be available to work there. Um, I uh, have a job um, at Archbold that starts at the end of this month. So I'll be doing um, scrub jay work and it's a six month uh, contract. So I'll be there through the summer. So I won't, I won't be able to go to Maine, but I'll be, you know, helping the birds in Florida, so. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. A lot of people think they should be the uh, state bird of Florida. Oh, yeah, I agree. I should. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no question about it. That's, that's not our official position as a chapter, but it's my <laughs> personal <Yeah>. position. Um, <laughs> um, I asked, uh, how many times do the turns renest? So yeah, so if they if the turns um you know fail their first round, they might go for you know a second uh, clutch of eggs, um, but there's a pretty limited window of um, how how much time they have to you know rear their chicks. So those those re re nesters um they're not as successful as the first obviously, but um we did see a handful of the Arctic's, um, since the Arctic terns were on the edge of the colony, they succumbed to um, predation the most. So we saw a few of those pairs uh, re-nest and um, uh, some of them were successful, some, some of them weren't. Uh, I have a question. Oh, Chloe <laughs> asks, uh, do you have any non-avian predators come to the colonies? Um, I think in the past they've had an otter that wreaked havoc on the island. And a few of the other islands had uh, mink problems and minks are horrible because they'll, they'll cache their, their kills. So they'll just spend a whole night, you know, collecting uh, adult turns, yeah, and just caching them. So they can cause some heavy damage. Um, let me think of any others. I think that's, the two mammals that have been a problem in the past. 
Um, oh, we have had a few situations with snakes. There's a few, uh, uh, yeah, like opportunistically, I think um, a few snakes have, have, have gotten some chicks. So I think that's about it. We haven't had a rodent oh. problem yet, which is great. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, you said that there were like some songbirds nesting on the island. Uh, do you ever see uh, cowbirds try to parasit, you know, parasitize? Yeah. Um, no, there wasn't many songbirds. It was mostly yellow warblers nesting on our island. And we didn't really have many cowbirds moving through. The only cowbird we saw was at our, like, we had a little feeder set up and it stopped by at the end of the season and it was a juvenile. So might have, might have happened. Who knows? Yeah. You, uh, during migration, do you, well, did you see any unusual songbirds? Oh yeah. So Stratton Island is actually like, has a lot of songbirds moving through because we have, do have that forest. So we had a ton of um, warblers moving through. I mean, special for me, maybe they were common up there, but we saw like a ton of Canada warblers. Um, I mean, everything singing too, which is awesome. We don't get that here in Florida. So, you know, I'd wake up and hear, you know, Northern water, water thrush singing, Black Burnian singing, Black Pool singing. So yeah, we had like a nice window of um, migrants there. Um, and yeah, those those were the most notable. I was really excited about the Canada's. Yeah, they're beautiful. Are there any uh, um, any other questions? Emily says, Emily says I would recommend that adults attend the adult camp on Hog Island to learn more about this project and to have a great time. Yeah, um, my my past um, employer Adam De Nuovo is the new volunteer coordinator there. And um, yeah, so they're, they're doing a lot of great stuff out there. Um, should definitely look into it if you have any interest in exploring Maine and, and you know, helping while you're there, for sure. Are you, uh, um, uh, 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 how, what are your feelings about the Stellar Sea Eagle being up there now that you're not there? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it happens, right? <laughs> But uh, I don't know. It's been going across the whole country, so maybe maybe I'll come down to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was telling someone I was like, I'm gonna if that I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna watch for that stellar sea yeah. stellar sea going until it pops up here in Alachua County. It was in Texas, so why not? Why not Florida? Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Sweet. Um, oh, and it, I meant to ask: Was there any like one day experience that like stuck out to you? from your stint? Um, let me think. Um, yeah, I, so unfortunately, the first thing that came to mind was a, a bad event, which was after the storm, um, going to our productivity plots the next day and just seeing the mass die off that occurred. It was kind of just like a, like a surreal moment to really see um, what a storm at the wrong time of the season can do. So that, that was, yeah, that was pretty hard. Um, but a good moment was um, seeing a lot of the roseate turns that I banded, because I remembered a few, you know, re field readable bands that I put on, seeing them out um, f fully fledged and seeing the parents, you know, feeding them and stuff. So a little rewarding moment there. Yeah. Nice. Awesome, thank you. Are there any other questions? Sweet. Well, thank you so much, Brian. Um, oh, Emily mm -hmm. says I have the book Project Puffin and we'll share with anyone who's interested. Thank you, yeah. Emily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys should definitely look into that book. It goes into much more detail on how the puffins return to, to the island, to the islands. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Uh, this was outstanding presentation i lo love turns i think i can't someone was telling me about like a, a you know a, a, um you know we, we just have like very limited opportunities oftentimes with turns here in alachua county and you know so it, they're always like it's always inter you know it, it, it's one of those things where like you know whatever opportunities we can get to mm -hmm. like sometimes the storms blow them in right to your big lakes yeah yeah it's like a tradition here to you know, go the, the, the morning after or of, you know, storm. Intense, intense storm systems to go out to 
our local lakes, but yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, thank you, Emily uh, Schwartz for, uh, you know, uh, 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 coordinating these programs. Um, uh, and uh, if anyone would like to uh, uh, watch this presentation um, uh, or share it afterwards, uh, I'll uh, upload it uh, to our uh, YouTube channel over the next couple of days, you know, sometime in the next 24 to 36 hours. Um, yeah. Um, and it'll also be uploaded to our website and our social media, et cetera. So um, thank you very much, Brian. Um, everyone have a great night. Um, and we'll uh, see you, see y'all at our, uh, you know, at our, you know, Wednesday wetland walks or check out our field trip, uh, you know, our calendar of events on our website and see y'all next time. Thank you so much. Thanks guys. Thanks Emily for inviting me.